Now the purpose of this video is simply an introduction to phasers and the use of them in producing a wave function from sines and cosines. Though once you understand phasers, then it's a fairly straightforward matter to add up any number of sines, and cosines are of course just sines with a different phase, a number of sines with various amplitudes and phases together to produce a single wave function. Now, phaser. A phaser is simply a rotating vector. It's a vector which has a magnitude, a certain length, turns, and turns at a certain speed, now the velocity isn't of any interest here because I'm just going to take them all to have the same velocity so they trace out one complete wave in a revolution and a starting position. So that in a simple diagram for phasers, a phaser would be a vector centred on this centre of rotation which has a certain length, which you could call anything you like, I'd call that R here, a velocity, which I'm not really interested in, I'm just going to take it that they all rotate at the same speed, and a starting position given by this angle here, from the standard starting position. Now the usefulness of these phasers is that during one rotation, no matter what speed it's rotating at, that's why I'm not interested in that feature of it, the vertical component of the phaser will trace out a sine curve when plotted against the angle x. Now the simplest phasor would be a vector of length 1 with starting position at the beginning at phase 0. I'm not interested in how long it takes to turn round, I only want to know what happens when it turns round once. And the way that it traces out a graph is by taking the vertical component. Because if you have a line like this and it's turned through an angle x, then the vertical component of that will be, just given that length 1, this vertical component y will be, that's the opposite side, so it'll be the sine, will be sine x, 1 times sine x. So if I plot the vertical component against the angle, it should trace out the sine curve. At the starting position, when x is 0, the vertical component is 0. Turn it through, say, 30 degrees, plot the vertical component, turn it through 60 degrees, plot the vertical component, turn it through 90 degrees, now it's at the top, turn it through another 30, 120, another 30, 150, halfway round, you're back to the start again, the vertical component zero. And then as you continue turning, now it's going negative, next one would be here, as you plot it along then the vertical point drops to there, and finally after you've gone through 270, you're down at the bottom, now you're starting to climb again. So that overall, it's traced out a sine curve. Now the handy thing there is then, you can associate this wave with that vector. This whole curve can be represented simply by a line of length 1 that's sitting at 0 degrees to the horizontal. So you could say that that phasor, length 1, starting at 0, starting horizontal, length 1, represents 1 times the sine of x. If the vector had a length of 2, it would do exactly the same thing, only this time the height of it would be twice as much. You'd end up with the same graph, only with twice the amplitude. And if you start with a phase, so that instead of starting at 0, you started at 30, that would represent the graph. If I start at 30 to the horizontal of length 1, that would represent the graph one time, so I'll just say sine, but that will be x, and quite sensibly, it's gone 30 plus 30. I should really have degree signs in there, but I'm just going to ignore them from now on. Now, whereas when you look at that equation, you think, oh, that graph means, oh, the opposite of that. It actually starts 30 back. In terms of phasors, it makes perfect sense. If I want to construct sine x plus 30, I have a phasor of length 1, because the amplitude is going to be 1, and I start 30 degrees up. I turn it, I get a starting angle of 30. It's now 30 up. And then you plot that as it turns. As you go through those consecutive 30s, 
Top is the top. It will once more plot out, I'm going to put squint here, a sine curve. Only this time, the sine curve's been shifted. It's got a phase to it. It has to finish where it starts. It's been shifted. If I was to complete that wave, then you would see there's a sine graph that's been shifted back 30 degrees. Whereas the equation is x plus 30. That follows straight away from the phase diagram. Start at 30 degrees, it'll trace this curve. That means the other familiar curve, that means that cos x would be generated by starting at the top. Cos x must be the same as sine of x plus 90. As if you take a phasor of length 1 with a starting position which is 90 degrees round from the horizontal, from the baseline, and then start turning, no matter what speed you're turning it at, this will generate, back to zero, this will generate, I've got a wee bit squinty there, a cosine curve. This then gives you four basic phasors for use with the simple wave function. Take them all of length one. If the starting phase is zero, then as that turns, the height that's plotted forms the sine curve. So that means the sine curve is represented by that phasor. If you start 90 degrees round and start turning, that produces the cosine curve. So the cosine can be represented by a phasor of one starting at 90 degrees round. If you start with a phase of 180 degrees and start rotating it, well, it's starting at zero, as that turns, it will produce this graph, which is a negative sine. So the negative of the sine of x would be represented by this phasor of length one facing backwards. And if you start with a phase of 270 degrees, then as that rotates, it'll draw this graph, which is the upside down the negative cos x. So negative cos x is represented by a phasor of length one, starting vertically down. So that will give you a phasor diagram that you can use to add sines and cosines or sines of different phases together. And the main directions in this phase diagram would be sine of x faces that way, negative sine of x faces that way, cos of x faces that way, and negative cos of x faces down the way. This also gives you the various ways you can interpret a result. If I start with a phasor in this position, say that this angle was 30 degrees, then there are four ways I can represent the graph. Know what the graph will look like. Starting here, it's going to go up, down, and back up again. So it's a shifted graph. But what will I call it? Is this a sine that's going backwards? Is it a cosine that's going forwards? Is it a sine that's going forward a lot? Or is it a cosine, the other top would be way back here, that's going back a lot? You see it all immediately from this diagram. The different ways I could represent, represent that phasor would be either I've got the sine of x plus 30 or I've got the cos of x but that's 30 away from 90, that's 60 degrees short of it. Just like this phasor here, if that was 30 below, would be sine x minus 30, you're starting 30 short. Or I could say I've got the sine of x, but instead of this being this leading x by 30 degrees, you could say it's trailing it by the rest. So x minus 330, since this is way behind the sign, if you want to think of it that way. Or you could say it's the cos of x of, instead of trailing the cosine by 60, you could actually say it's ahead of it.
it's ahead of it by this amount. So that would be ahead of it by 300 degrees. It's actually 300 degrees ahead of the cosine. That one little arrow lets you switch between those different representations. Not to mention the other four, if for any reason you wanted to write it as the negative of the sine of something. So, how do you use phasors to reduce an expression involving several terms, several trig terms, several waves, into an expression with only one term, one wave? Well, as an example, we'll take this simple expression. If I've got 3 cos x plus 4 sin x, and I wish to resolve that into a single wave, how would phasors achieve this? The first thing to notice is, of course, the frequencies must be the same in order to do this. In terms of the phasors, that means the phasors are rotating at the same speed. Well, the first step would be, how would you represent these two terms on a phasor diagram? Well, there's a set of axes for the phasor diagram, although in future we won't even need that. And then 3 cos would be a vector of length 3 in the cos direction. 4 sine would be a vector of length 4 in the sine direction, like that. Then as they turn, they will trace out their respective waveforms. The graph they will produce as they rotate, remembering the graph is produced by taking the vertical components of the rotating vector. Vertical components will look like this Pixar Studios, <laughs> where that was the graph of 4 sin x, and that's the graph of 3 cos x. Now the resultant graph of adding these two together, the resultant wave from adding these two separate waves together will be found by adding their values, which are the vertical heights. So adding their various heights together would trace out this curve. It could be a sine curve that's going back, a cosine curve that's going forward, a cosine curve that's come back an awful lot, a sine curve that's going forward an awful lot. You could consider it as, with a different amplitude of course, either a sine or a cosine curve of x plus or minus some angle. Now the phasor part. The resultant waveform was obtained by adding the values of these two waveforms. Those values are of course the vertical heights of the graph, which corresponded to the vertical components of these phasors. And when you add vectors, you add their horizontal components and you add their vertical components. So quite simply, that graph could have been obtained by adding these two vectors together and simply rotating the resultant. And that resultant would be, just adding the two vectors together, this vector. That should trace out this during one turn. As this turns, it will trace out this curve. Which means to reduce these two waveforms to a single waveform, I need a very simple diagram. Where you go, I would just need to do this. How would I represent 3 cos x plus 4 sin x? Well, 3 cos x would be a vector of length 3 pointing this way. 4 sin x is a vector of length 4 facing that way. The addition of those two vectors, the resultant of those two vectors, will be the same as adding them nose to tail. In this simple case of coses and sines, of course, that will just form the diagonal of a rectangle. If I'm calling that part k, k will be the length of the hypotenuse, and this alpha will all depends which way I want to write it. But I can see from this straight away. Remember, that's sine and that's cos. It's either ahead of the sine by this angle, we'll call that alpha, or it's behind, whoops, what did I write that for? Behind the cosine by its complement. That diagram does the lot. So what should it be? Well, k is obviously the result of Pythagoras and that little right angle triangle. And you know that one, 3, 4, 5, so I can state that straight away. k is 5, 
because that was a three, four, five triangle. And similarly for the angle, normally for the angle you'd have to say, well, the tangent of the angle will be these two sides, the ratio of those two sides. But you may well learn or remember that for a three, four, five triangle, the angles are 36.9, 369, quite easy to remember, or it's complement 3531, odd numbers going down. So in this case, opposite the smallest side, it'll be the smaller one, that'll be 36.9. And I'll just do it in degrees here. So straight away with that one simple diagram, I can write this in all its forms. I can say, how could I express whoa, 3 cos x plus 4 sin x? Whichever way you would like. Let's have a sine. Very well then, that'll be 5 sin x, and it's ahead of the sine by this angle, 36.9 degrees. There you go. How about a cosine? Very well then. That'll be 5 cos x, but it's behind the cosine. It's trailing the cosine in the direction of rotation by the complement of that, so that'll be at minus 53.1 degrees. Like another variety of that sine. If you have a desire to be a little bit awkward, you could say, ah, that's not leading the sine round. It's actually trailing the sign by that big reflex angle. Very well. It is behind the sign then. And it'll be behind the sign by whatever it takes to make up to 360. That'll be 323.1 degrees. Ah, you would say, but that's not trailing the cosine. It's actually leading the cosine. Very well then. That'll be 5 cos x plus whatever is left from 53.1. That'll be 306.9 degrees. There, in an instant, this little diagram, these two lines, okay, three, put in the hypotenuse, gives you all these answers immediately. Well, after a bit of calculation. But this little diagram also shows you what might be the best form for it, which is the one with the smallest acute angle, for instance. Well, that will be this one here ahead of the sign. Or which is the one with the smallest positive phase? Well, in this case, this one here ahead of the sign. Another example. Well, actually, there's two examples. How about this? Two further examples, and then you could have two to try yourself. First one. How about writing 2 cos x minus 3 sin x in the best form? Which I'll see. What's its best form for that? Well, firstly, how would you represent 2 cos x minus 3 sin x? 2 cos x. That's a vector pointing up of length 2, that's where the cos is, negative 3 sin x. That'll be sin x going backwards for 3. What's the resultant? Here's the resultant. So straight away I can see the most appropriate form would be leading the cosine. The best form for this would be something cos x plus an angle. And I'll just stick with degrees here. Do the meridians if you want. What would be the appropriate lengths? Well, What's the resultant of these two vectors? Actually, we better put the three up there because it's this top triangle I want with this angle in here. Well, I have to do some Pythagoras this time. So if I want to do some calculations, calling it K or R, K in this case, K squared would be 2 squared plus 3 squared. Well, that's 4 and 9 is 13, so K is going to be root 13. And the angle? Well, for this angle here that's leading the cosine, the opposite is 3, so the angle will be the inverse tan of 3 upon 2, which is 56.309, so we'll just call that 56.3 degrees, and there you are. What's 2 cos x minus 3 sin x? That will be root 13 cos x plus 56.3. And if you desired any of the other forms, the diagram shows you them. That would be ahead of the sine by 90 more than 56.3 etc. Another one. Another one. Well, if I specify a form this time, well, if I say, well, if I've got to make them all negative, negative 4 sin x minus cos x, write it in the form of k for this new amplitude, but in the form of sin x plus the phase. Well, the diagram, what would it look like? 4 sin x pointing backwards, negative cos x, that's one lot of cos x facing downwards. The resultant will be in here. That's the resultant. 
k, that'll just be the length of that, so I'll just put the 1 over here. And the angle alpha, since I want it ahead of the sine, would be this one, which is ahead of the negative sine. I'll have to take 180 onto this, so I'll just call this something else just now. Oh, beta, for instance. What have I got then? Well, k, k squared will be Pythagoras, 1 squared and 4 squared, 1 and 16 is 17, k will be root 17, call that angle beta, whatever you like just now. That will be inverse tan of opposite, 1 upon 4, which is 14.03, just call that 14.0 degrees, which means that this will be root 17 sine x plus 180 plus that, 194.0 degrees. Fairly easy. Here's two to try yourself. So the first one. Write this as a single wave in all its common forms. Well, diagram first of all. 12 for the sine, 5 for the cos, positive sine, positive cos, so the resultant phasor would be this one. I'll start with the sine for instance, so I'll work out this angle here, I'll call that angle alpha. So I'll put the 5 in there. Right, ready to go. First thing would be, if I'm calling that k, I've got straight away k is 13, because I know my 5, 12, 13 triangle. Now you probably won't bother learning the angles in a 5, 12, 13 triangle, so I'll work that out. Alpha would be the inverse tan of opposite 5 upon 12, which is 22.619, 22.6 degrees. So what are the various forms then? Well, they're all going to be 13. Start with the sines. It'll be 13 sine x, and it's leading the x by that 22.6, so there you are. That's probably the best form of it. Well, but the other sine form, well, that means consider that as trailing behind the sine as they rotate. So that'll be behind sine by the rest of that, that reflex angle that makes it up to 360, that'll be 337.4 degrees. Well, but the cosine will all still be 13. This is behind the cosine by that complement, which will be 67.4 degrees. Or you can consider it as leading the cosine. The cosine's trailing behind it by the remainder of the angle. So it's leading the cosine by 292.6 degrees. Next one, 3 sine x minus cos x in the best form. Well, you'll know the best form once you draw the diagram. 3 sine x, so it'll be 3 across the way in the direction of positive sine. Negative cos x, that'll be 1 down the way in the direction of negative cos. So there's the resultant. Best form would obviously be lagging behind the sine. The best form for that would be k sine x minus alpha. Well, that's k and that's alpha. So I'll finish off my triangle here, translate it over. Now it's just use this little right angle triangle to get those two numbers. Well, k will be k squared is 1 squared plus 3 squared, so that's 1 and 9, which is 10, so k will be root 10. And alpha, that'll be inverse tan of opposite, which is the 1 upon 3, which is 18.4 degrees. So the appropriate form would be root 10 sine x minus 18.4 degrees.